My name is Monk Rowe for the Phillies Jazz Archive. I'm privileged to have Lawrence Juber with me today. Congratulations on your career. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm envious of, uh, of it, mostly because I really admire people who wear different hats, who do this for a while and find they can do that for a while. You know, I, I'm blessed with having had a career as a musician. And I, I really, from the very beginning, I, my goal was to be versatile. Because around age 13, I, I learned about being a studio musician and how that was a, if you could get into that world, that would be a reliable source of income. Um, Can I ask you how you learned about? I, I played, I, there was a local band leader, trumpet player, who kind of mentored me. He wasn't really a trained musician, but he was kind of one of those local kind of semi-professional guys. And um, he had a quite successful little combo that played weddings and you know, corporate events mm -hmm. and stuff. And I found myself on the bandstand, you know, at 13 years old, with musicians that were, you know, professional level players. In fact, the drummer. Uh, Martin Drew uh, was a huge Oscar Peterson fan and eventually became Oscar Peterson's drummer in, in the UK. Um, and I remember the first gig the bass player leaned over and he said, Lad, if you don't know the chords, just play the bridge if I got rhythm. <laughs> you know, cycle of fifths, rhythm change. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and very useful advice. Well, you know, and of course, I didn't know the chords, but, but that was my ear train, well, it really was, of, was on the bandstand. What kind of songs would you have been playing? When oh, this? that was, you know, I mean, Strangers in the Night, you know, Spanish Eyes, I mean, but, but standards, a great American song right. Because this would have been like 1965, you know, round about there. So what I was listening to was not that at all. That was, I was listening to the Beatles, the Stones, the Animals. And, right. And then through the stones, I discovered Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf and, okay. and, and you know, the, the roots. I love watching, uh, playing with older fellows. You, you not only learn the music, you watch how they operate with the audience and taking requests and the, the whole thing about playing a gig. Yeah, it, it, I understood the professional context of it. That this was a job. It wasn't just get up there and show how fast you can play or, uh -huh. or whatever. Because it was, it was always, for me, it was about the, the act of making music. The, and I really didn't have a lot of repertoire. I didn't study in the way of, of kind of building a, a repertoire for myself. It was like go and play and figure out what was going on in the moment. You know, it was, it was quite, I was quite improvisational at that point, but I was also studying music. I, I started playing classical guitar in high school. Mm -hmm. um, that was something that really got me engaged. Music appreciation was extremely useful to me because I learned how to listen to music. And I would, and I discovered Bach, for example, from, there was a record called The Lover's Concerto by The Toys, you know, which was the, you know, one of the Anna Magdalena waltzes, da, 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 And it was like, whoa, what's this? And that led me into Bach, and then I got hold of a record of Julian Bream playing the Bach lute, uh, Bach lute suites on classical guitar. Uh, but the first record that really drew me in was, was a, a, this trumpet player, um, Phil, gave me a record by the, um, the Candoli brothers. Cartier who were and Pete. Yeah, who were, you know, the L.A. studio players who were representing kind of the West Coast, you know, the L.A. jazz scene. And, you know, this would, I guess that record would have been made early 60s. Howard Roberts on guitar. And I'd slow the record down and try and figure out the licks. And then I discovered Django Reinhardt. And, but I was also doing the same thing with Eric Clapton with John Mayall's Blues Breakers and Jimi Hendrix. And, I had a little band with some friends of mine and we'd get together once a week and whatever the new Who single or the Stones single or whatever it was, we would learn it. And you, you learned it by playing the record? 
Yeah. I mean, just learn it off the record. I mean, you didn't go out and buy the sheet music. Because the sheet music was always, you know, some kind of semi-accurate yeah. piano arrangement. It was with, like, ukulele chords. And, so and in the wrong you, key, probably. Was, oh, yeah, typically, yeah. Do you listen for the, do you recall listening for the bass notes? Oh, totally. Okay. I listened to all the parts. We had Radio Luxembourg was, you know, broadcast from the continent, so it wasn't restricted to the same uh, playlist that the BBC had, which was at that time, I mean, we had, we didn't have Radio 1, Radio 2 until somewhat later. I mean, this 1963, 64, it was the light program or the home service or whatever. And it was, so you got a very eclectic mix of music there anyway. But Radio Luxembourg was all American Top 40. So that's where I heard all those records. I had Motown records for the first time. Uh, and I'd be listening to what the rhythm section was doing, you know, how the bass and the kick drum worked together, um, as were Lennon, McCartney, and Ringo, and, and, and Harrison, as far as they were listening to that stuff and then creating a British version of it. In fact, the first time a Motown song was ever played on British radio was by the Beatles in 1962. Oh. I yeah. forget which song it was, but there was a live broadcast and they played a Motown song because you didn't hear that, and then you did. Then all of a sudden you started to hear that stuff. And, and it, you know, it was, there was, we got Tamla Motown because they had the two, you know, they had Tamla and the Motown, and we had, you know, it was a joint label in England. Um, but I was listening to a lot of, of, of American R&B and soul music and, and reggae too. Um, and uh, I was just fascinated, like, for example, with some of these corporate gigs that I would do with this band, they would have a steel drum band, would be like, you know, the alternate band. And I, I was just fascinated by the rhythmic articulation of that. And, and so when I was listening to records, I was listening not only to the parts, but also to the, the groove. And I didn't really understand to begin with, I didn't understand it until you know, once I got into studio work and I realized that I was playing those, one of those roles. I was coming up with licks or grooves or you know, little inner moving parts. And it started to make sense as I got deeper into music theory, how it all fit together and the, the whole puzzle of it. Did you get a reputation in the studio for a certain style? I, I was kind of, I was a versatile guy. Okay. I mean, if they needed a banjo, that you know, I'd, I'd go and borrow a banjo for the session. Or, um, but because I understood the nature of the versatility. Now, as a teenager, I was playing with rock bands, as well as doing the, the, um, you know, the kind of the money stuff. You know, and, and the, you know, I mean, making five pounds for a gig was a lot better than babysitting or or washing my neighbor's car, although if I washed my neighbor's car, I got tickets for Tottenham Hotspurs games, so, you know, which was the local soccer team, so it was kind of, you know, it was worth it. <laughs> but the, but I was doing a lot of stuff. I mean, as soon as I was able to, I, I started going to National Youth Jazz Orchestra camps and hooked up with an alto sax player, and he and I would go, I was probably about 18 at the time, he and I would go and play gigs where we had no repertoire, we would just improvise for, the, for a whole gig, you know, just like riffing and grooving and stuff like that. Any musical experience was handy for me. So I was studying classical guitar, I took that up to grade eight um, because I needed it in order to study music. You know, I took grade five classical guitar so I could do A-level music, uh, took grade eight so I would be able to go to college. And by the time I left high school, I, I knew I, was going to, I wanted to be a studio musician. I got accepted at Leeds College of Music in the north of England, which was the closest thing we had to the Berklee School of Music, as far as you could actually study jazz and you could study all that stuff there, versus going to one of the conservatories, for example. Um, but when I got better exam grades than I expected, in fact, my, my music teachers just were shocked that I got an A in music because I was kind of on the hooligan side, you know, as far as I wasn't 
legit, I wasn't part of the classical canon. I didn't play an orchestral instrument. Oh. I was a lousy piano player. And guitar was kind of the orphan stepchild of all of that whole world. Um, and still, to this day, is somewhat that way. Right. Um, so when I got better grades than I expected, I said, wait a minute, why am I going to leave London? You know, I grew up in London. I've been paying my dues as a teenager. I'm getting demo sessions. I'm playing with all these bands. Why do I want to leave all that? So I canceled my application to, to Leeds. Took a gap year. I was a pioneer of the gap year. I mean, this was like 1971. And I applied to Goldsmiths College, London University, which was the only place in London that you can actually study musicology and music theory and all of that within a degree structure that didn't require being you know, basically a, you know, a church organist that could improvise fugues in three parts you know, with hands and feet and do all that stuff. Uh, because there was still that kind of church music thrust in, in music education. And Stanley Glasser, who was the professor at um, Goldsmiths, I went in for my interview, and we spent the whole time talking about Barney Kessel and Joe Pass and oh. you know, American jazz guitar players, because he understood the nature of my world, and he was my champion at Goldsmiths. I mean, you know, for ear training, for example, and I was not that great at transcribing, you know, like, you know, um, when it would be like Schoenberg's you know, oh, yeah. F-sharp minor string quartet, you know, stuff like that. Um, and sight singing, did you have Sight singing, sing? I was okay, because okay. I could sight read. I learned to sight read in a, a rainy afternoon when I was 11 years old. I have a book called Play in a Day. Okay. Burt Whedon's Play in a Day. Um, and you talk to anybody from that generation, okay. they all learned how to play in a day. And in the back of the book is when the saints go marching in, and it's in C, and the, okay, that's a C. That's a C. I get it. You know, it wasn't rocket science. Can, can I ask what your parents thought about or your path? Uh, I mean, they were fine with me playing guitar from their point of view as long as I had, you know, like something to fall back on. And, and I was never academic enough to go for medicine, you know, which would have been kind of the brass ring was be a doctor. You know. So, you know, I said, well, maybe a pharmacist. <laughs> you know? but, but the thing is, my, both of my parents left school in the mid-teens. I mean, my dad at 14 and my mom at 15, because this was London during the Blitz. You know, you, they came from the east end of London, which was kind of like the Lower East Side in New York. I mean, it wasn't a wealthy area. And there were dr bombs dropping all the time, and it was like their educations were really disrupted. And, and my dad wanted to be a tailor. And it, he also loved saxophone. And it, what he wanted me to do was play, play the tenor sax. And for my birthday, you know, when I was like nine, eight, nine, and ten, I would get a recorder, you know, which was like you know, heading in that direction. And it was like, yeah, okay, this is kind of fun, but it's not, it's not what those guys are playing on. It's not what the shadows are playing on television with a red Stratocaster and the fancy foot moves and all that stuff. Did they like that music? It was kind of suspicious until November of 1963 when Beatlemania crested in England and the Beatles performed on the Royal Command performance. That was the show where John Lennon made the wisecrack about you know, clap along and those of you in the, you know, the, the those of you, you know, rattle your jewelry, the, 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 uh, the kind of the hoi polloi and the, you know, the royalty. Um, that kind of legitimized the guitar. My, I, my 11th birthday was a week later and I got a guitar. That was the, and it was not a great guitar, but it was the best guitar in the world. Was it an acoustic? Or? It was an acoustic. Yeah. It was a little Russian or Czech, sort of Czech made acoustic. Because that, that, that was kind of where you got your low cost guitars from, was what is now the Czech Republic, it was then Czechoslovakia. Because they had you know, a centuries old tradition of, of guitar making. Mm -hmm those areas. Um, and it was, the action was like this, so, but it had a floating fingerboard, that, which is, that goes back to the old Viennese school of, of 
guitars in the early 19th century where they had like a key that would, you could adjust the, the fingerboard. Oh. I didn't know that. It, for me, it was just like there was a bolt and you could, you know, and, and the, if you stuffed cardboard underneath it, it, it raised the act, you know, it, it raised the fingerboard enough that nice. it actually, it was playable. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing, the, it wasn't a real ebony, um, real ebony fingerboard, it was, you know, kind of painted black, so all the black stuff would come off on your finger. But, but it was my instrument and I fell in love with it. And I guess, you know, that it never let go and it's still, I still love it. And, and after I'd been playing, after I'd had it a week or so, my dad took me to see a friend of his who was an amateur guitar player, who showed me how to play an F major seventh chord, mm -hmm. which was the most gorgeous thing I'd ever heard. And then he showed me how to play a C9 chord, which was you know, equally gorgeous. And, and I think that that, I internalized that sonority, the, the tone of an acoustic guitar, really became something very precious. To me, which is, I think, what ultimately led me back to being a specialist in acoustic. Because you took classical, guitar has always mystified me a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm a piano player and a saxophone player, but because you played classical, and if you play the F major seven and you're looking at your hand, you know what the notes are. Of course. But not, not all guitar players do, I don't True. think. But yeah, I mean, there are, I've, I've done concerts with guitar players who are purely primitive in their conception of the instrument, but can do remarkable things. Right. You, know, um, you don't have to have the musical understanding. But what's interesting about the guitar, and kind of unique, because, I mean, in the context of it being affordable, portable, versatile, um, and capable of making a complete musical statement because it incorporates rhythm, harmony, counterpoint, melody, all within its accessible um, performance. That what's curious about the guitar is because the, the notes are not in fixed positions. You know, you can change the tuning, for example, and the notes move. That if you understand music and you play guitar, then the meta information, the pure musical information, which never changes, I mean a C is always a C, but it moves into different positions, depending on the context. Uh, even in standard tuning, I mean you could play a middle C in four, five different positions. Um, the, the mental process there is, is different because on a piano, a note is always a note, it doesn't shift. And mostly on, a, on an orchestral instrument, on a, a band instrument, the notes are mostly in the same place. I mean, yeah, you can do crazy fingerings and overblow notes and stuff like that on the sax, you know, which is really cool. But on the guitar, it's, if you combine the musical education and the, and the guitarology of it, the guitaristics of it, that's when you get into some really interesting and unique musical areas. And that's something that just completely engages me. Well said. Well, you went from, I was looking at your, has played with <laughs> everyone from Alan Parsons to Rosemary Clooney. Yeah. That, and that was all in the space of a couple of years then, you know, back in the 70s. I mean, but it goes way beyond that. I mean, uh, you know, three out of four Beatles played with at least two Muppets. Actually, more oh. than two months. I played banjo for some of Kermit's stuff. I'm on not the, sure which is better. Be <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're both up there. Well, actually, uh, doing a, a, a session with the great Gonzo was, uh, it was Paul Williams, Willie Nelson, and the great Gonzo all at once. I was, I, I was a giant. because <laughs> you know, you know, Paul's not a tall guy. Willie's not a tall oh. guy. And the great Gonzo is about this big. And you forget it's a puppet. You know, the guy that's operating it just fades into the background and you're, you're interacting with, with this, you know, what feels like a, a real character. Which is what's so great because when, you, when a, a character is that real, even if it's, you know, blue, <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> yeah, then it, after you're done, it feels weird because a person comes out. Yeah, exactly. And they, oh, what's yeah, it's, a, it's a kind after? of reality check. <laughs> but I mean, I, this really goes along with the ambition to be a studio musician. Was just that it doesn't matter who you're playing with. It's, it's making music. I mean, it looks good on the resume that you know to have. Uh, that record with Rosemary Clooney was really cool. And I was, you know, I, what was I, 24, 25 at the time. It was mid-70s in London, and she, had, she was making a comeback. She was on tour with Bing Crosby. Sure, it was not long before he died. And it was just a very cool experience, you know, playing with somebody of that kind of caliber. Um, the Alan Parsons Project, I had no idea that I played on the record until I read it in Musician Magazine 25 years later. It was a session at Abbey Road on a Tuesday night and there was a string orchestra, a harpsichord player, some mandolins, an acoustic guitar. And it didn't say on the music what it was. And at Abbey Road there's this long staircase that goes all the way up to the control room. You never went up there if you were, you know, if you were a studio player. You didn't go up there unless you were invited. The first time I ever went up there was actually I was doing a record session there in April of 78, and there was a phone call for me, which was, you know, was before cell phones, and, and it was like really unusual, and, and I went up to take this phone call, and I said, oh, that's the control room. <laughs> and it turned out that it was McCartney's office asking if I would go and audition. <laughs> and they called you at Apple. Yeah, well, they, at Abbey Road, I mean, because they, they tracked me down. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. But, um, you know, it's always been this kind of, oh, Hear some music, come up with a cool guitar sound, play. Oh, and who's the artist again? <laughs> you know, and it just has over the years, because not just in London, but in Los Angeles too. Because when I got to LA, I got very involved in the studio scene, and not so much on the record side, more on the TV and movie side. Okay. So you know, walking into a session and there's you know Ernie Watts playing sax on you know in the section. Or you know, and these great drummers that I've worked with, Jim Keltner and John Robinson and Vinnie Caliuta. Um, you became like the second Wrecking Crew. Well, it was a different, it was, yeah. it was a different world. I mean, the Wrecking Crew, really, that, the span of that was 59 through 75. Uh -huh. That was when the record business was really, really cooking. Um, but there was, you know, the, 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 the business just continued and, and Walking into a Disney session, you know, I played on Pocahontas, for example, Colors of the Wind, and there's this huge orchestra, and there's you know, eight double basses, and three harps, and a guitar. <laughs> Don't you at least have to know what instrument to bring? You just bring them all. <laughs> and that was, yeah, I mean, the cartridge companies did great. I mean, I, if, I, if there's cartridge in the budget, and not that I do a lot of sessions now. I mean, mostly if I do a session, I just walk in with a couple of acoustic guitars because I tend to get booked on that level. But, I mean, there would be sessions where I'd have, you know, multiple amplifiers, maybe two dozen guitars. Because you have to have all the different instruments. You got, you know, if they call for an electric 12-string or acoustic 12-string, banjo, mandolin, what kind renaissance of lute. What were, who were some of the producers that you worked well, in L.A., I did a lot of work, and still do, with a producer named Michael Lloyd, who's very, very pop, very pop producer. He did, like, teen stars in the 70s, um, Sean Cassidy and Leif Garrett and people like that. Um, but we did a lot, of, a lot of stuff, especially in the 80s. I mean, Belinda Carlisle's first album. We, there was a song called Mad About You, which was a big hit, around about 87, 88. And, you know, I first heard it on the radio. I never really heard the whole song, because when we cut the track, it was just me and the drummer. Yeah. As a session player, very often, you know, it's, it's a utility gig. That, and I'm just, I, I would, for that, I was just playing eighth notes on a Fender Stratocaster and, with the drummer, and, and we had a chord chart, and, you know, laid down a track, and then I hear it on the radio, and I say, oh, that's what that was all about. And, and then we did, um, there was a low budget movie that we were doing songs for that um, ended up being called Dirty Dancing. Oh. You know, and that's the biggest selling album I ever played on. I mean, Time of My Life, She's Like the Wind were big hits. And that album sold over 40 million last time I looked. Do you get checks in the mail? I, 
mostly it's direct deposit these days. Oh. But, um, but you know, what, what's really been an amazing thing is when I, when I first started doing sessions in London, you know, it was, I forget what it was, it was like maybe, you know, I think 17 pounds or something for a three hour session. And then I, I joined Wings and it's a whole different, you know, a whole different uh, experience. And what got me into wings was my versatility also. I mean, that's always been kind of a, a calling card for me. It's the fact right. that I could play multiple styles, which that's the way that Paul operates as an artist. Paul McCartney operates is that stylistically it was all over the map. I mean, we, you know, we did a song, one song we did. Baby's Request was done as a demo for the Mills Brothers. And it starts off with me doing my best kind of Barney Castle licks. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and then we do kind of this almost punk rock kind of stuff. And then, you know, big kind of McCartney ballads. And it was just, it was really, it was a very broad stylistic range. Because you're not dealing with an artist that works in a specific genre. You're dealing with an artist who creates his, his genre. Uh -huh. you know, he is the genre. What was the audition like? I, I you know, I, I borrowed some Wings LPs from my brother, <laughs> and it turned out that um, what we played was some Chuck Berry tunes and some reggae grooves, you know, and they offered me the gig. Um, but when I when I got to LA, it was it was a very different world because the union, uh, the AFM, was much more involved than the English musicians union. Oh. So all of a sudden I find myself, you know, I did some jingle sessions in New York for Lincoln Mercury and then all of a sudden I'm getting all these checks, you know, whereas in England I go do an 8 a.m. jingle and you get paid for the session and that's the end of it, you know. And I'm starting to get checks from local you know, 802 in New York um, and then when I move to L.A., local 47, and I'm getting into doing you know, movie sessions and I played on, there was one piece of original music in The Big Chill, where one of the characters has a TV show, and we recorded a theme for that TV show. And the next July, I get a check from the secondary payments fund for you know many thousands of dollars, because there were only a small group of musicians who played on the score. And you know that's when I discovered that. And then um, when I started getting to composing, and I, I did... Um, uh, the Brady Bunch Christmas movie, A Very Brady Christmas, and all of a sudden I get this package in the mail and I've qualified for health insurance. You know? So um, it was a different, you know, it, it, it was a more evolved business model. And, and now, you know, in, since um, Sound Exchange, you know, I get performance royalties for my airplay on Pandora or Sirius, or, you know, for my own stuff, but also the secondary, secondary markets fund, uh, the SAG-AFTRA now have a performance fund, PPL, which is the, the UK one, which picks up the neighboring rights. That's where I see more money from the, the Wings records that I play them, for example. Yeah. Um, and it was only later that I started learning about ASCAP and BMI and you know, right. being able to pick up kind of the writer side of the, the royalties. So, you know, it, it kind of expanded my vision of where the revenue streams were. But to begin with, it was just, you know, write out a little invoice, send it to the contractor, or fixer, as we call them in, in England. A man named David Katz was the one who got me started. You could see me on television with um, the National Youth Jazz Orchestra and called me up the next day and said, and he called everybody darling, and he said, oh, darling, I've got some sessions for you gave me the dates and I said, David, I, I hate to say this, but those are my final exams for my Bachelor of Music degree and I just, I couldn't, you know, I'd been studying for three years, I wasn't going to skip the finals and I didn't think I'd hear from him again, but as it turned out, he called a couple of weeks later and, and he became my kind of studio mentor and eventually um, I, he got me into the sessions for The Spy Who Loved Me, for example. I got to play the James Bond theme, which was, oh, how right. cool was that? Well, this may be a, a silly question, but with did your did your ears and hearing survive the Wings experience? Yeah, we weren't that loud on stage. Uh -huh. um, I think that 
playing with headphones on for years has done more damage to my hearing than... Yeah, we, we, we were... You know, we had a good sound system, and we, Paul didn't like being that loud on stage. It, we, but Wings was more of a pop group than, than, a, than, you know, a than, than the kind of full-on rock bands that you know, are playing at the jet engine decibel level. Yeah. Was he a good boss? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a great education. I got my master's degree from McCartney University. He was a good boss. I mean, uh, he still, you know, we went to Japan and he got busted on the way in. I mean, it, was, it wasn't that good a boss in that respect. But as a creative boss, in terms of being in a, a creative situation, first time I'd recorded a guitar solo with him, we were doing a song called To You. And I was playing in the studio and Paul was in the control room with an even tied harmonizer changing the pitch of every note that I was playing and it was like it was so cool because we were in that musical moment where we were improv I was improvising he was improvising but in a techno way it was very clever and then the next solo I did was kind of a rockabilly thing where I'm just sitting closer than you and I are sitting. It's right here, and I'm I'm playing and just eye to eye, you know. Just and he brought stuff out of me. I mean, as a producer, that's the great thing. That was where I really. I mean, I worked with some really fine producers. You know, George Martin was one of the first producers I worked with, the Beatles producer. And we did it, and I did played on an album for Cleo Lane and John Dankworth, and and George Martin was producing, and and just his whole manner. And putting you at ease, you know, and I was pretty green at that point. You know, we were doing something in B major, and it was like I was toughing it out without a capo. You know, now I would never hesitate to, to put a capo on. But you know, this was kind of more of a jazz context, and I was really, you know, I figured, yeah, I can, I can do this. Of course, it was, you know, it took a little, little patience there, but. Now, actually, I mean, now I would not hesitate to play without a capo in B major if I was doing something really creative because B major, is, you have, um, and G sharp minor, for example, you know, you have three open strings in G sharp minor. You have an E, a B, and an, and an F double sharp. And, you know, using open strings is, in terms of the texture and the sonority yeah. is something that, you know, over the years I really learned uh, the value of. But there's nothing like, you know, playing it in A and putting a capo on the second fret. Do <laughs> you sort of take it in stride, or are there times when you reflect on the fact that, well, I've played with most of the Beatles, and I played under George Martin, and mm -hmm. these are people I listened to when I was 15, and uh, what a life. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing life. Um, but I think that I'm still learning, you know, and I still look forward to the times when I get to work with somebody of um, stature, of musical stature, or, or not necessarily of stature, but of, of musical depth, and just how much more there is to learn. I love being able to go and do a concert with an orchestra or a session with an orchestra because I get home and I pick up my acoustic guitar and I've, I've got bassoons and I've got cellos and I've got inner parts all, you know, the, orchestra, the guitar orchestration is part of what I do. And so to be able to reflect on that, the, the, the musical substance of all that. Um, and it's just, it, and part of what I do now is to pay it forward. I mean, I do a lot of pro bono high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, mm -hmm. where I'll just go and I'll do an assembly and play for the kids and explain what a guitar is and what you can do with it. And each age group has its own particular kind of, you know, resonances. I mean, the yes. little kids, you know, Mr. Did you meet Kermit kind of thing. You know, whereas the video game music that I've written appeals to the high school. I see. You know, so it's just, I, I think what I really appreciate is the ability to have a life in music mm -hmm. and to be able to be creative, whether that's as an artist, as a guitarist, solo guitarist, and, and my main focus, or as a composer, um, as an arranger, um, producer, 
all the different nuances of it, working in musical theater, working in theater, improvisational theater mm -hmm. too. I mean, I just did an album of, of improvisations with William Goldstein, who's a, a film composer, who practices what he calls instant composition. You give him three notes and he'll you know, spin out a whole composition out of it. Well, he and I improvised an album, which just came out a few months ago. Oh. And it's the, the joy of listening back to something and, and knowing that you, you achieved something in that musical moment where you weren't trying to force the issue, but just allowing creativity to happen and how much interesting and engaging music can come out of that. You know, it's a lost skill in the non-jazz, rock, folk kind of world. I mean, when you get into the classical world, improvisation has, mm -hmm. has kind of, uh, they've forgotten yes. that that was really the root of it. Do you have so, kids? Oh, I do. I have two daughters and I have two grandchildren yeah. too. Well, but my youngest Just like daughter, us. Yeah. How old are your grandkids? <laughs> How old are my grandkids? Three and one. Three and yeah, one. same as us. Ooh. Yeah. Do, they, do your kids, um, this sounds silly, but, but do they know your, of your accomplishments? Oh, yeah. yeah they're, they're my, both of my daughters are very hip. <laughs> my youngest daughter is a, is a successful songwriter. Um, and she found her own path with it. I mean, when she was a teenager and, and beyond, we supported her, encouraged her. She knows the business, she knows how it works, and she's having hit records, and not only as a writer, but also as a singer. Last year she had a platinum record in um, Germany, Australia, Sweden, oh. South Africa, as a singer and as a writer. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're aware of all of this. Um, it constantly surprises me how enduring the Beatles' legacy is and how deep that goes, the Beatleology, you know, just the, 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 the musicology of the Beatles yeah. has become so advanced in terms of the historical aspect of it, the social aspect of it, the, even the, the instruments and the, the recording process and everything and how unique that, that was and how enduring well, it will I, be. I, I couldn't agree more and we came from, we were in Liverpool before this and uh -huh. did the thing. Yeah, I'll be there and, next month. And um, we were in the Beatles shop and there was this scholarly looking book and I opened it up and it was about the Beatles songwriting and I, uh -huh. I landed on this sentence and it was talk, talking about mm -hmm. the use of the Locrian scale mm -hmm. and I thought, Wow, that goes they, back to I mean that goes back to Wilfred Mellers and you know in the mid mid sixties he wrote a book called Twilight of the Gods, which was a, a very intense musicological analysis of Beatles songwriting. Well, your your career reminds me of uh, Bucky Pizzarelli. Uh huh. You know. Well, that's who, a, who, a who fine. You know uh, fairly well. And he's, yeah, what what's next? Talent. What's tomorrow? Yeah. And, yeah. 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 I, I, just have, I have a, an album, I have a vinyl album of Bucky Pizzarelli uh, with, with a group of other guitar players doing arrangements of Bix Beidebeck's yeah. pieces, piano pieces, yeah. for, like, in a mist and stuff like that. Yeah. It's so cool. Well, just a couple more things before we wrap up. I, I wondered, um, do you recall the, the most difficult studio experience you ever had? Did, did they ever have to do a retake because of you? <laughs> oh, yeah. But you have, to, you have to acknowledge the fact that there are times when you just need a little more time to work something out. Um, sometimes it just gets purely scary. At Warner Brothers, for example, Warner Brothers soundstage. It's a huge soundstage, like the size of a football field. And in one corner there's an isolation booth. Another corner there's an isolation booth. And if you're in an isolation booth, you cannot hear, which is typically where the guitar gets put, you can't hear the conductor. And if you don't have headphones on, you're screwed. You know, so it's like, come back from a 10, sit down, they've already called the cue. Headphones are on, the click, eight free clicks, and you know, the baton is up, and it's like, 
no idea what we're playing. You know, and it's like, okay, stop tape. Now, nowadays, it's much easier. In the old days, they had to rack up film. When I first started doing sessions at Paramount in, in the early 80s, you know, they were running film. They would project film. And it was very old school. You know, it was still the tail end of the old studio orchestra system. Um, so, you know, I've had my embarrassing moments. Um, but then, you know, sometimes you just nail it. And it's yeah. like, you know, and, and, and I've had experiences where, you know, it's just eight pages of altered tuning 12th string on a, you know, a Western style score where it's just acoustic guitar and a string orchestra. Well, the person and, who arranged that must have known what well, the guitar it, was capable of. That particular, that particular composer, Dan Follier, who uh, I've worked with for over 30 years, he did um, Roseanne, Home Improvement, um, a lot of shows. We did a show for 11 years called uh, Seventh Heaven, where the guitar was, acoustic guitar was extremely prominent finger style acoustic guitar and he would always write in different tunings and but he knows the instrument but how do you notate that you can't write tablature because the copyists wouldn't know what to do with it so we worked out a system where he would write it in standard notation and i would play it as though it was in standard tuning so if i saw an e at the top of the stave i would play the open top string, even though that might have been tuned to a D or a C sharp. So I had to turn off that inner ear thing that goes along with sight reading. And he would use multiple tunings during the session. So I'd have like two, three, sometimes even four guitars. And that kind of thing, uh, we thought we'd invented that. And then I discovered that in fact, in the, in the mid 19th century, there was a man named Henry Worrell who was a, a teacher at a girls' school in Ohio, who published a piece called The Spanish Fandango, which was neither Spanish nor a Fandango, but, but anything Spanish was extremely commercial at that point. And that was written in open G tuning, D, G, D, G, B, D. And he had actually published the same piece of music with a different set of variations a few years earlier under the name of the celebrated Violet Waltz. And in that, he used the normal practice of you just write it the way it sounds and you have to figure it out. I mean, I've encountered pieces from the 1840s in open E tuning where you just have to do the transpositions. They don't give you any hints. But what he did was Henry Morrill wrote out this piece so that you played it as though it, like, as though it were in standard tuning. You tune the guitar the way he says and then you play it like you read it, like you're playing in standard tuning. But what you hear is, is different. And so it actually had a long history. That piece has some very deep, uh, the expression of that was very deep because it, it became, and some people will argue that it's the root of the blues, it's not. But the mechanics of tuning a guitar to an open chord really got established through that because that piece ended up in um, a lot of guitar tutor books, especially there's a man named Septimus Winner who published the Eureka Method. And if you bought a guitar from Montgomery Ward or, or Sears, you would get this Eureka Method would come with it. Oh. And so a lot of people learned how to play in open G tuning. And you know, it, you only need one finger to make chords. And you can play primary chords, you know, open strings, fifth fret, seventh fret. So yeah, I mean, somebody that's heading in the direction of a 12 bar blues We'll use that. And you can play this, I, one of the things I do in my presentation, play the Spanish Fandango and then play the Rolling Stones Honky Tonk Women, which was written in open G tuning. Uh -huh. And the melody is almost identical to well, the chorus. It all Not comes that, around. Yeah, because it, it, it's the mechanics of it. You know, there, there's a lot of aspects to the guitar that come out of the mechanics rather than out of the pure music. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the challenges. Of, of, of being able to address those kinds of uh, demands made upon the musician mm -hmm. by, the, um, by the composer. Yeah. Or even just a technological thing where there was a period where nobody really wanted to stick a microphone in front of an amplifier. And it, in the 80s, everybody was wanting to record direct. Yes. You know, and it's like you don't get that. 
Yeah, that, no that tangible thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, you learn how to be accurate, and you learn how to be. But but the ultimate thing I think is that it's having that kind of faith that it will work out, because it can be pretty scary sometimes. Yeah. You know? And and orchestrators don't always know how to write for guitar. Mm -hmm. You'll see, you know, you see a chord that you know it's unplayable, and you're sight reading, and it's like okay. What's going to work in this context? And I've seen guitar players come a cropper because they'll see a G7 chord in a jazz context, but they won't play the right voicing. I see. They'll play, you know, like a cowboy G7 chord, so, which will work great in a bluegrass context, but doesn't work if you're playing like Freddie Green. You want, you know, you only need three notes. You only need root, seventh, and third, and you've got, you know, and then you, you're in that realm. Right. So you have to understand the musical context, but. I think that, and this goes back to the beginning of our conversation in terms of the versatility. Yeah. I, I try not to draw barriers between musical styles. And I fi it's fascinating, I watched, on the plane, I watched Miles Ahead, the Don Cheadle movie. Oh. That's like the biopic about Miles, yes. you know, in that mid-70s period. And the fact that Miles refer didn't refer to his music as jazz, he referred to it as social music. And Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock referred to what he was playing as electric church music, recognizing the, you know, the spiritual aspect of it. But those labels are very convenient you know, for marketing purposes. And you, know, you go into iTunes and it's like, you, there's a list, you know, when, I'm, when I'm putting my music in, it's like, how do you describe what I do? You know, acoustic, I mean, it, I come up as, as pop, folk, jazz, country, <laughs> you know, those are just labels. Music is always music, and it's, it's the marketing of music, and it's the placement of music, and how it gets tangibly recognized, that is, that's where the labels come in, but like I was saying earlier, C major chord is always a C major chord, yeah. it doesn't matter what style, you just have to know how to voice it. Well, even tomorrow night in the concert, I, I noticed they didn't, really bill you as a blank guitarist, mm -hmm. which I thought was good. You're, yeah. you're a guitar player and you're choosing your own uh, program, mm -hmm. and which, which sort of brings me to uh, our, my last question. And when you get a song started, and it be kind of, that's a big haul, by the way, and you've got all those people watching you, and you've played the melody, mm -hmm. What makes you decide where to go with it? Depends. Where I go with, with an arrangement or a composition. It may be completely set, completely fixed. Even though there's improvisational arms in it, and even though I may have improvised it in the recording. It's like Nat King Cole, for example. Didn't improvise in concert. He played what he played on the records, because that's what his audience expected. That's the entertainer side of the equation. They may have been improvised in the studio. Um, so there's times, you know, I think tomorrow night I'll probably play Cry Me a River, for example, an arrangement of that. And that's a fixed arrangement. I'm, it was improvised when I, when I recorded it. But I learned, you know, I've, I've had it published. You know, the arrangement was published. And Arthur Hamilton, who wrote it, is a friend of mine. And the great thing was that before I ever recorded a note of it, I played it to Arthur. And the, the joy of being able to play a song, an arrangement of a song to the, the guy who wrote it, or the woman who wrote it, is, that's pretty special. Um, but where I go, I mean, I, when I played Jimi Hendrix Little Wing, I, it, it was an arrangement that evolved out of improvisations on stage. And for a period, I, I pretty much had it set. And then, especially in more recent years, because I've been getting deeper into improvisation, not just musical improvisation, but my wife Hope wrote a play that's set in a theater improv workshop. And working with, and I, I not only produced it, produced the play, but I also played the shows live, where I did, with an mm -hmm. acoustic guitar. And, and actually, at the end of the play, even though it's scripted, they do improvisations. And I would, collaborate with the actors, you know, doing underscore and then 
occasionally the guitar will become part of the improvisation. You know, and when you're not bouncing off musicians, but bouncing off mm -hmm. actors. Um, it really rekindled my, my enthusiasm for improvisation. And, and you know, when I'm playing electric guitar, or even you know, acoustic guitar with, a, with an ensemble, I can stretch out a lot more. Playing solo, the issue really is there's no bass player, so I have to pick up the bass notes too. And that tends to kind of restrict me in certain ways. But like when I'm playing Little Wing, I just, I just go where the muse takes me. But as an entertainer, I also have a responsibility to the audience to stay on the, on the path and let myself, you know, I, I pick my, my spots. Okay. Basically. Um, so, but in, as time goes on, I think more improvisation tends to come into it. But you know, some of my compositions are very fixed, just like they would be if they were, quote, classical. Yeah. Well, this has been fascinating for me. Oh, good. You have been encyclopedic about <laughs> knowledge, and as I said, I admire the versatility. Well, thanks. Which is very important to make a living in music. Well, that's exactly it. Yeah. And the guitar, because the guitar covers so many different stylistic areas. I mean, it's not, you know, you play clarinet, Sure, you could be playing you know, Dixieland, or you could be playing klezmer, or, or playing with an orchestra, or you know, doubling on saxophone and doing studio work or whatever, but you're not going to be playing bluegrass, for right. example. Uh, unlike, you may be playing like, you know, Greek folk music or something, but mm -hmm. you know, in certain musical contexts, it doesn't fit. You know? But the guitar kind of fits everywhere, and, and sometimes, even when it fits, it gets ignored. I did a concert, we, we have an organization uh, in the LA area in Pasadena called Music, M-U-S-E slash I-Q-U-E. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a crossover concert series. And we did a concert a couple of weeks ago in uh, uh, Caltech in Pasadena where they have a huge lawn and 1,300 people, families. And, and there's an orchestra and the rhythm section. And the orchestra, all the strings are standing up except for the cello and the basses. Um, and the woodwinds, most of the woodwinds are standing too. And we did a lot of Gershwin. I did a so my solo arrangement of Over the Rainbow, and then I did an, an orchestration of uh, the Beatles in my life, where I started solo acoustic, brought in a small woodwind section, and then bring in the strings, and then I switch over to electric guitar, and the rhythm section kicks in. Uh -huh. um, you know, so it made a kind of a, a performance piece out of it. Um, but there were tunes that we were doing which just the guitar would have been perfect for, but the guitar doesn't get orchestrated for. I see. You know, like the Pasadena Pops, for example, I don't play with them. Uh, Paul Via Piano is a local guy who specializes in classical. They do Vivaldi's Four Seasons. They don't use a harpsichord for the continuo, they use a guitar. You know, it's like. That was always the case in the in the early Baroque, was that you know, you had your lutes and theorbos and you had a big rhythm section. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just a harpsichord. Right. It kind of became distilled down to that. We think, but then you start to look at performance practice and you realize, wait a minute. You know, so, so Freddie Green was doing his thing back then in this sense. Well, yeah, there was yeah there was you know in in Renaissance Italy you know. Monteverdi Monte Monte did Orfeo, he had his Freddie Green, yeah. Yeah. Frederico Verdi. <laughs> well, I wish you the best in your future projects, and well, at the same time, much. I hope those uh, residual checks keep coming. Well, let's Maybe. hope so. I get my pension next year. So. Right. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.